Welcome to this DGO 2020 presentation on local context, global benchmarks. It will include a set of recommendations for an adopted approach using the UN eGovernment Development Index as an example. My name is Morten, I'm one of the co-authors and I will present this paper on behalf of my colleague Jeremy Millet and myself. Both Jeremy and I have been privileged to work with organizations such as the European Commission, UNDESA and national governments on assessing the impact of technology in the public sector and in service delivery specifically. First, we're going to look at the evolution of e-government benchmarks and assessments in general and then we're going to move into three sets of recommendations before concluding. Just as an introduction, e-government benchmarks have traditionally set out to measure both operational performance and benefit realization in our process towards a digital society. Its aim, their aim is to provide evidence for policymakers and to ensure that they, through this evidence, have a better understanding of the outcomes and the impacts associated with technology use in the public sector and society at large. Most of the e-government benchmarks are related to the stage and maturity models for e-government. They tend to have a particular focus on the supply side, i.e. the availability of something, and of what type of technology it's made of. To date, however, there is a number of, of initiatives that are looking at capturing the national level, uh, but there's very little focus on value generation or the value added of things. So again, if we're only looking at the supply side and the technology, it's difficult to assess the impact and thus use it for decision making. So looking at the evolution of, of e-government benchmarks, a number of things pop out. And particularly in relation to the UNDESA biannual e-government survey and readiness index. First of all, uh, the UNDESA index covers uh, 193 UN member states. It has been in, it's been in place since 2001 and will be uh, launched for the 2020 editions in July, as far as we understand. It is based on a set of statistical sources, including ITU and particularly for telecom infrastructure sub index. This is the database. And for human capital or capacities, the UNESCO database is often used. Again, member states of the UN is providing this data. The online service index and the e-participation index are focused and based on a number of indicators collected through a survey of the different member states. So again, there's about 200 indicators in the 20. Uh, 18 edition and similar amount in the 2020 edition. Since 2018, there's been a pilot on local online services, so measuring 40 global cities uh, in 2018, and this has been expanded to about 100 cities for the 2020 edition. Now, the UNDESA example is interesting, not just because of its global coverage and the fact that it's been in place for almost 20 years, but because it has also illustrates a number of the current weaknesses and the classical approach to measuring e-government and digital transformation. So again, it focuses on the country level and only recently has it started looking at city level. The European Commission's DAISY has broken this more down and is in some cases looking at the regional and local level, but also across different user types. Again, there is very much a silo approach and this we also see in other research as for instance, the 2019 report from Digital Future Society looking at digit, how to measure digital inclusion. And also we see a large number of smart city measures being proposed at the moment. Again, the focus is mainly on the supply and little attention is, is really paid at different levels or sub-national levels of government and on impacts and outcomes. So again, we see some trends though. First of all, there is a need to uh, address the insufficient measurements of value creation. This is illustrated in figure one, where we look at efficiency, sort of the benefit of the uh, benefits for government, but also how do we create more for less, the effectiveness, so the benefit to the user, and how governments can't choose their users, but have to serve 
everybody on equitable and equal footing uh, and how there's benefits for society. So how do we balance the different needs of society? So again, we must balance these. And again, uh, e-commerce e and e-business is a concern only in terms of, of the first two levels of this. So efficiency and effectiveness. Again, we need to uh, also ensure that we don't make things overly complicated when we measure things. Again, we also see some trends in terms of, of measuring um, e-government. So we see uh, a move up the value chain. So again, we see increasing focus on outcomes and impacts. We see movements down the government hierarchy. So increasingly looking at the sub-national levels. And we see things moving out of government uh, institutions. So looking at multi-stakeholders and the impact on, on them. And also in terms of data collection. So again, we see some things. In terms of recommendations, we have three sets, as I mentioned earlier. Jeremy and I was focusing, uh, uh, having a lot of discussion on this when we were drafting it. But basically, because of the massive growth in economic cloud, cities, particularly the big cities and the surrounding metropole areas, uh, do tend to be large enough to have sufficient power and resources to implement change, even without regional or central government assistance. But again, some of these issues are also relevant. Well, in fact, most of them are relevant also to municipalities that have low population density and are based mostly rural or are a mix of urban rural. But again, you see the cities having increasing resources available due to population growth and, and migration and urbanization. So again, local authorities are often better put and better positioned to identify the specific needs and the differentiation between needs within their local communities rather than a, a federal uh, national level or a regional level. Again, we recommend uh, this city focus and local benchmarking that UNDESA started with the LOSI in 2018 be expanded upon and include at least one city per country and perhaps more in particularly the larger countries because the biggest city in the country or the capital cities often not fully representative of what city and local authorities are doing across a country. Now, there's a bewildering array of, of existing smart cities being measures being proposed. Uh, a colleague of mine, Judy Backhouse, actually identified about 53 and has mapped them. So we, we're going to look at the smart city building blocks that we see uh, across these. And we recommend that you look at Judy's paper when it's published uh, at ISCOF 2020 uh, in September. So have a look at that. It is referenced in the paper, so you'll be able to find it. Really uh, a few building blocks. So smart economy, smart enablers. Here we're looking at both a mix of transactional services, such as e-commerce, e-banking. We're also looking at big data, artificial intelligence, distributed ledger, uh, child protection, robot use. So again, more uh, than just uh, online services and, and data analytics and backend systems, but really technology in terms of robotics, automated vehicles, uh, smart meters, etc. are being proposed on that, but also sort of fossil fuel use, etc. emission rates. Similar for, for enablers, we're looking across a big array. You may now say, well, some of these things are already measured in, in the UNDESA uh, EGDI on a national level, but our point here is that this needs to be, be duplicated at a local level so you can aggregate and disaggregate data across different levels. So if we measure at local level, we can aggregate it up to national level and we can break it out. So a city is, an, is able to measure itself against other cities, but also benchmark itself in a regional or national context to see if it is performing uh, above or below or at national average or where to learn from its peers. So again, breaking down things and disaggregating and aggregating it is important, but also a, a challenge. Again, smart environment, smart government, smart living. We see that reliable access to technology, uh, to electricity is a key foundation here. Interestingly, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, more people have mobile phones than have access to reliable electricity supply. This is partly because they're using uh, other people's electricity supply, using uh, solar panels that are off the grid, etc. So again, here there's some variation. Again, access to documents, uh, 
application of smart community services, open government information uh, being provided, satisfaction indexes or service level agreement performance could be relevant. Again, looking at satisfaction for key services that are provided at local level and aggregated, disaggregating it could be of interest. So again, there's a, a lot here. Also in terms of smart mobility, sort of real-time traffic information, uh, sharing of bicycles uh, and, and car sharing systems, online parking systems, uh, smart technology and IoT in that regard, but also for instance a number of autonomous vehicles or electrical vehicles as a proportion of the, the total volume of uh, vehicles in an area. Again, online services being used, civic engagement, cultural resources, um, available of, of feedback mechanisms, etc., are being proposed and could be considered uh, to complement the LOSI further uh, without sort of encroaching or re on other smart city indexes or, or sort of duplicating information but rather based on sharing. So again here we think and we recommend that we should have a greater focus on, on how uh, existing measurements such as the UNDESA EGDI and the LOSI and OSI can be used to, to contribute to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda or even the Paris 2015 Climate Accord and how we link it. Currently this is not systematically linked. So again here we recommend that there's a mapping exercise and we look at some core indicators that are applicable in the sort of 80% of cases, but then can be can 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 tell us a lot and give us indications of where to dive down further. So again, here we can also look at clusters of services or service areas, such as education, etc. Um, this is also important in in light of of the current pandemic, COVID nineteen, uh, where we find that if you don't know where people are, where your weaknesses are in a geographical sense in an urban area or region or national, we find it easier to to get the decisions made on on facts. Yeah. So countries that do not know how many people live in the country, except with every ten years census and how they're distributed, they may have a, a gut feeling, uh, but they will have to spend more time in terms of a, a identifying location of people, migration patterns internally in terms of the COVID coronavirus pandemic, or uh, in terms of a national disaster. So it, knowing these things can give you uh, both insights on where you might get most value for money by, by addressing your, your weak areas first, but can also buy you valuable time in terms of, of conflict or, or natural disaster or pandemics. So again, here we can do shifts. Again, uh, we should look more at the demand side and use side. Uh, this is particularly relevant if we want to, to measure value more. Of course, we need to look at it in a quantifiable sense. And we should really look at, at looking at how we can automate collection of data. So for instance, both the UK and Denmark have had experience with measuring online service use across different uh, service channels and different service areas. And for instance, e-services and call center data is, is automatically available through these type of backend systems. Again, it would be beneficial to map this up and benchmark yourself also in terms of private sector equivalent to government online services or call center services like commerce or, or banking. This will allow you to benchmark also in terms of the skills and access so for instance, uh, if 80% of people use banking services in your city or in your country, but only 40% use the government e-services, well, you know that there's a big untapped potential because the 80% have access and the skills to use the e-banking service. So they would also more or less be able to use most government electronic services. So again, the untapped potential. Uh, so here again, also, um, diversifying the data collection obviously it has a cost implication with the multiplication factor but for instance the digital future society study uh, showed that of of the major global initiatives only GSMA the telco uh, organization measured things and broke it down on for instance gender of owner of approximately 300 different indicators, only seven of them were segmenting on users. So how can we measure, for instance, digital inclusion 
and the inclusion, equal use of technology by women and men if we don't measure on something as simple as gender. Again, looking at linking it to the open government partnerships, etc., could also be encouraged and, and to look at, at joint frameworks and collaborative actions. So, in conclusion, uh, a new approach uh, is starting to emerge when we look across different measurements and, and different types of benchmarks, uh, including um, UNDESAS, where, where LOSI, the local angle, came in in 2018. But we also see that we shouldn't just throw out the old type of indicators, but we should rather consolidate and, and look at some minimal uh, standards and common denominators that will give us a lot of insight uh, and will give us an ability to make a knowledge-based decision. We should also try and look at different collaboration measures. Of course, we should never try, we should, we should weigh the cost-benefit here. So again, the multiplication uh, factors of 193 countries, different segmentations, regional level segmentation, so forth is obviously a balance. So we need to also consider less is more in some cases and allow for regional variation on plug and play type approach and add uh, elements. Anyway, this is just running through the presentation very quickly. Uh, Jeremy and I thank you both for your attention. Uh, we hope it's been of interest. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or any thoughts on this. We are open to collaboration on this. Our email addresses are here. Uh, again, if you have questions, let us know. And we thank you and hope you will enjoy the rest of DGO 2020. Thank you.